Hey everybody, welcome back to Optimal Health Redefined with Sheila and Dr. Diane Ginsberg. Today we're going to talk about osteoporosis slash osteopenia. What is the difference? How Bone loss, you... right? Bone loss with aging. Yes, so we're going to talk about the difference between those two terms. How do you get this? What is the answer? There's a lot of questions about this. I think a lot of people are really confused that um, I think some of the misconception is I've got osteoporosis, I fall tomorrow, I got a broken hip in the hospital. Or I have so, osteopenia, I have any yeah, bone loss. And any what's the difference? Yeah. And when do I get screened? And what makes a difference? Right. So, so we, let's start with how do you develop osteopenia, porosis in the first place? What is the difference? So remember, everything in medicine, right, has a grading scale. Like how do you become hypothyroid or how do you have a blood pressure problem? Everything has some kind of normal grading scale. That's how LabCorp comes up with your numbers or any doc when anything you see, they go, okay, these people in this category do well. Therefore, we get rid of the bottom 5%, get rid of the top 5% and that becomes our norm. So in looking at women that had falls and problems with aging, and I guess men too, what they found is when they could do, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a DEXA scan. So it's dual absorption. I can't remember the whole long word, but basically when they shoot the beam through the middle part of the bone. So think of your bone like a gazebo, the old fashioned gazebo. So there's a, it's a, got a lattice work and that lattice work is what the inside of the bone is. The cortical bone is the outside part. So the stable part of the gazebo is the cortical bone and the lattice work that keeps it standing is the trabecular bone. As you age, the osteoclasts, C, cut down the lattice work faster than the blasts can build and you lose stability. So the gazebo can't stand if the lattice work is broken down. So that dual absorption beam goes through and it'll tell you that your lattice work in your gazebo is less, so therefore the spine processes can't sit on each other, where the hip can't hold you up, and that's where the crack and the fall and all the bad stuff comes from. That machine is calibrated to determine how well you fare, say, relative to somebody or a bone structure that we know won't collapse. And so you are graded based on how you compare to what we know is a bone that won't collapse. And when they came come up with the system, the, the lower down on the system you are, the higher your chance that the bone's gonna give. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so in looking at fractures that developed, when your score was zero to 0.9, the chance that you had any kind of fracture or women had any kind of fracture or men had any kind of fracture was very, was basically zero. So that's considered normal bone. As you went from one to 2.4, they saw weakening in the bones. As you got closer to the bottom, fracture probability got a little bit higher. So that's saying, hey, you're starting to get bone loss. And that's where they call it osteopenia. Think of porosis as holes, parotic. So pores, so as you get below two and a half in that score, think of that you've got big holes punched in that lattice work, and that's why the, the area is so weak, and so the bone structure can't hold itself, because you're holding your whole body up, right? You're holding that body weight up. So as you get below two and a half, the chance that you can crush one bone on top of another increases, and that's where the term osteoporosis comes from, and the fear of if I'm down there and I fall or I trip, the bone is so weak that it can't withstand the forces of the fall. So that's where the fear of fracture comes from. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that definition, the question is, how do you stay as strong as possible? How do you not let that decrease? Well, the number one thing you have to understand is what's going to maintain bone strength, correct? So what's going to maintain your strength is Number one in women especially is estrogen. Estrogen is anti-inflammatory and it's very important. And I'm gonna let Sheila talk more about the details of what else goes into making you have a healthy bone. But estrogen is significantly important in enabling the osteoblasts to grow faster than the clasts can cut anything down, which maintains strong bone. 
Now, you have to respect it. You have to move your body. You have to keep your muscles strong because the muscles pull on the bone and then that creates resistance and that creates bone turnover and that creates health. And that's anything in the body, right? If you don't use your brain, it doesn't work. So, so maintaining that through your life becomes significant. However, in women, what happens is the brain and the ovary disconnect in the 40 to 50 year old range that I've talked about in some of our videos, estrogen fluctuates. And as estrogen fluctuates, that's the perimenopausal range. You'll get low times of estrogen. Maybe you may still have a period, but you're gonna be lower in your estrogen than you were say at 35 or 25. So that net decrease in estrogen is going to affect the ability with the other things. This is even assuming that you don't do anything bad, assuming that your habits are all good, that you're not doing any of the bad things we're gonna tell you to stay away from. But then what happens is, is that the, the estrogen itself drops so the bone turnover becomes less efficient. So now the clasts are higher than the blasts and you wind up having weakness. And that's where a lot of women at 50 are recommended to get their first bone density and they find, oh, now I have osteopenia. Now I have signs of bone loss. So what we really want to get across is what's important to not get there in the first place. And if you are there, what you can potentially do to help it. Because the big thing that we hear across the board is take more calcium. And it's like anything else. Never do too much of anything because it's not going to make a difference. And we hear, unfortunately, we'll take 1,500 milligrams of calcium. Or like Sheila said, you know, she, her mom heard, drink all your milk. You'll, if, if you take 1,500 milligrams of calcium and that's what you do, you'll basically have a pile of calcium in your body. And then your body has to figure out what it's going to do with it. And with aging, as blood sugar dysregulates, the enzyme that puts calcium in the bone doesn't do that anymore. It starts sticking it everywhere else. So therefore, saying, hey, I'm not on hormones or my hormones aren't where they need to be or I'm not doing all these other things I need to and I've just got to take all this extra calcium that my doctor told me to take, it's not going to change anything. You're just going to have all this calcium floating in your body. And studies have been done. You read the medical literature that when you just increase calcium, those people had hardening of the arteries because the body's just storing it anywhere. So it's really about the whole big picture, putting everything together to enable to keep your bones strong. And some of it are things that you're gonna have to work on, you're gonna have to do every day to be conscious of, to keep your body healthy and not just about putting a pill on top. And I'm not against meds. I, I, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the osteoporosis meds, but there's some people that really need them. So I'm not telling you not to take them, but I'm telling you, you gotta support your system. Yeah. So you wanna go into some of the things you can do to help? So the stuff that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So calcium, yes, is important. But again, like she said, is calcium going where it's supposed to go? And you so, can get it, right? You can get it in natural sources. You don't have to take all the extra. Right. So you can. So, of course, dairy is a source of calcium. However, a lot of dairy that's super highly processed and pasteurized does not have the enzymes to help your body break it down so that calcium goes into the right places where it's digested. So, you know, that's where raw dairy products, which people find very controversial, but you would get more calcium absorbed from a raw dairy product. Um, <clears throat> the other thing would be leafy green vegetables, um, things like canned salmon. Those are all natural sources, bone broth. Now, if you look at um, almond milk or um, some of the dairy substitutes, orange juice even that have calcium added, that's usually calcium carbonate, which is not very well absorbed. So I don't know how much of that calcium you would actually get. Those products will also usually contain vitamin D2, which again is not very well absorbed. So vitamin D is vitally important because it tells calcium where to go, make sure it gets into the bones. And in order for vitamin D itself to absorb, you do need magnesium and glutathione. And you also need vitamin K2. So everything in the body kind of builds on each other a lot of natural foods will kind of come with this. So um, one of the things, you know, if you had a grass-fed milk and you made your own yogurt, you would get a lot of K2 and D, calcium and glutathione from the raw dairy product, all of that together. Um, that's kind of harder to find these days, but that is, you know, kind of one thing you could do there. There are some supplements, so there are medical foods. Um, Designs for Health makes one called Osteobin that has genistein in it, which also helps with building bone. I guess it's having to do with the osteo. Blast. 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 It upregulates the blast. So medical food just means it's a, basically a dietary supplement that they've done 
studies that someone actually decided to pay for and they've seen results of increased bone density. So we've used that a lot. It doesn't have a ton of calcium in it. It has a lot of these other factors and kind of divided amounts. Um, there are some myths of things. So uh, one of the big myths that used to be perpetuating was that if you eat an acidic diet, you will leach calcium from the bones and that'll cause a lot of problems. If you look at the medical literature, that has been shown to not be true. So your body has a very you know, controlled pH of seven. If it went outside of that range, you would not live. So you wouldn't just lose bones, you would lose life. <laughs> so that doesn't really happen. And, and actually eating, especially when you get older, maintaining enough muscle mass by eating a good amount of protein mm -hmm. from good quality sources is very key. Um, <clears throat> the other thing on there was that carbonated beverages, I get that question a lot, carbonated water may leach calcium from the bones, that has never been proven. Although drinking soda has shown to decrease bone density. That may be because of the sugar in it, but even diet sodas have been shown to do that. But of course there's always, is it correlation or causation? Is it because people that drink diet drinks all day don't drink anything else? Are they not living healthy lifestyles? Are they not following other good habits? So we don't know what the connection is, but it does seem to show that the more soda you drink, the less bone density you may have. I personally think, and I know you agree with me on this, that strength training is probably the best thing that you can do to maintain your bone density. Whenever you are pushing that muscle to the point where it has to adapt, it is also gonna put pressure on the bones. And anything you put pressure on is going to have to adjust in a positive way. So I really suggest doing, especially the big muscles of the lower body, deadlifts, squats, lunges, two to three times a week and lifting significant weight for you. Find someone to help you, mm -hmm. a personal trainer or someone that's trained so you won't hurt yourself, but lifting five pounds is not gonna do it. Lifting little, you know, you really do, even just for some women starting with body weight will be enough, but you're gonna have to progress beyond that. So adding in strength training would be key. And yeah, then, because a lot of, a step on that, a lot of people, they go, well, nothing's changed. Why did this happen? Nothing changed, but it did, you got older. Yeah. And, and you really, we really, I can't stress that enough. As you get into the 40 to 50 year old range, you're getting older, it's perimenopause. And as you cross over into those menopausal changes, you are getting weaker. Your muscle mass is fading. You get more insulin resistant. You don't put the glucose in the muscle as well. You don't build the muscle as easy from natural things that you used to do. So just living from 45 to 46 to 47, you're gonna run into trouble if you don't support the system. It's even more important in menopause, but it is just as important there because that's why you do wake up and you go, okay, now why did my bone density change? So it really needs to be an initiated habit early that's done on a regular basis. So just a quick summary, things you can do to increase bone density. Optimize your estrogen. If you're postmenopausal, have it checked. You may need to supplement. Correct. Do some bioidentical hormone therapy. Right. You will probably need some kind of supplementation, but not just calcium. So Correct. I really recommend something like Osteoben that is specifically for bone health, or you can take these individually in smaller amounts. Then the other thing would be strength train, strength train, strength train, and avoid sugar and soda. Drink good, uh, you know, drink a lot of water, but get a lot of good quality protein in your diet. Those are all things that will contribute to healthy bone density. Absolutely, don't overdo the calcium. Everything in moderation to work together. Stay healthy.